<laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> And thanks especially to the Women's and Gender Studies Program and the Departments of Biology and Philosophy, which have sponsored this event. And to Marva Dirksen, co-chair of Women's and Gender Studies, for making this evening happen. And of course, to Joan Ruffgarden for sharing her work with us tonight. This semester marks the 20th anniversary of the first offering at Willamette of the fe course Feminism, Gender, and Society, designed as the introductory course for what was then the minor program in Women's Studies. Much has changed on this campus since then, and much has changed in the program. We now also offer a catalog major in women's and gender studies, and the number of faculty participating in the program has grown from the initial four to over 30. We're still a little short of courses in the natural sciences. <laughs> Tonight's visitor is well aware of the resistance within academic disciplines to challenges to establish paradigms. Dr. Ruffgarden holds a PhD in biology from Harvard University and is as you can see, Professor Emerita at Stanford University, where she taught from 1972 to 2011. Her many accolades include a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, as well as fellowship in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is the author of nearly 200 articles, as well as eight books. The work that brought her to the attention of many of us in fields outside the biological sciences was her sixth book, Evolution's Rainbow, Diversity, Gender, and Sexuality in Nature and People. Published in 2004, Evolution's Rainbow cataloged a jaw-dropping diversity in the natural world, where at least 450 vertebrate species engage in same-sex couplings, where many species have three or more genders, where intersex females, female bears give birth through their penis, where giraffes have all-male orgies, where Darwin's Victorian account of aggressive males and coy females looks increasingly absurd. Rather than continuing to tinker with Darwin's theory of sexual selection, Ruff Garden proposes replacing it with an alternative model of social selection, which you'll be discussing further this evening. In her most recent book, The Genial Gene, Deconstructing Darwinian Selfishness, Ruff Garden critiques claims that selfishness and individualism are basic to biological nature, offering alternative evolutionary theories that emphasize teamwork and cooperation. In the cooperative and collaborative spirit of women's and gender studies, please welcome Joan Ruff Garden. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, and uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you very much for the opportunity to visit, um, and to Marva especially, wherever you are. <laughs> oh, and Marva. And uh, I really appreciate how much work it takes to get a, a seminar organized, and, uh, and you're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, and it's wonderful to be here on such a lovely day as well. Uh, as you know, I live in Hawaii, and, <laughs> and as it happens, the last few days in Hawaii have been extremely rainy, and we actually had 10 inches of rain in the town I live in, in Kauai, in one day. And uh, we had a lot of flooding. So, uh, in coming here, it was actually an improvement in the weather. <laughs> so, um, let's begin. As, as you know, there's been uh, a lot of discussion in the public sector about um, the emergence, if you will, of the degree of variation in gender and sexuality among people. And uh, the political sector is concerned with uh, whether or not marriage should be uh, a legal right, and there's variation among states in this regard. And in the religious sector, there's a lot of discussion about whether same-sex sexuality um, falls within the bounds of, within the limits of inclusion, and maybe same-sex sexual, sexuality is just um, beyond the pale and, and not uh, to be included. So one would, one sees all of this discord in various sectors of our life, and one would hope that uh, science would be above this, that the discovery of gender and sexuality variation among animals would be associated with um, a, a calm reflection on, on its implications. But it, in fact, turns out that there's a lot of 
discord in science as well, provoked by the emergence of discoveries, by the discoveries of variation in gender and sexuality. So what I'd like to do for you is to review the discussion that's going on about how to take account of the gender and sexuality variation that we now know exists. And so therefore the title is Sexual Selections Changing Definitions. And sexual selection is the area of evolutionary biology that um, enunciates the sex roles, the statements of what males are supposed to do inherently as males and females are supposed to do inherently as females. And in the last 10 years especially, sexual selections definition has been changing increasingly to accommodate new, explana uh, new data. And it does do, does do this successfully to some extent. But the question will be whether it goes far enough. And is there any modification to sexual selection's definition which can uh, still stand up? Uh, and if not, then we might need to shop around for an entirely new approach to understanding uh, courtship and mating and parental care. And as you'll see, I've offered an alternative to sexual selection theory, even as revised, called social selection. And so I'll lay out what that is. So, so what I have to offer is a sequence of definitions and tell you about what the evidence is that has provoked the, the sequential revisions. So sexual selection 1.0, if you will, tracing to Darwin, is a very clear statement of what males are supposed to be like and females are supposed to be like. And these are direct quotes. Males of almost all animals have stronger passions than females. So they have the phrase passionate male. And you notice the phrase almost all animals. So, you know, this should be true of males pretty generally in nature. The female, with the rarest of exceptions, is less eager than the male. She is coy. So we get the coy female. And the idea is that if you just go strolling out into a park somewhere and you look at a bird or you pick up a butterfly or you pick up an earthworm, whatever, whatever it is you pick up, the idea is that the male is supposed to be more passionate and the female coy. But this should be generally true about nature with just a few exceptions that aren't enough to worry about. And how does courtship go on with these passionate males and coy females? Well, the idea is that females choose males. So they're sitting around choosing. And they choose males who are either more attractive or who are more vigorous and well-armed. And that's a, an inclusive or, so and or. Uh, attractive and well-armed. Just as man can give beauty to his male poultry. And the reference here is to animal breeding. And as you know, people who breed uh, cocks or cockfights breed them, breed the males to have armaments on them and also breed them to have uh, beautiful plumages and so forth. And so the idea is that females, through their choice, are breeding males to have the properties that they have. And so the cause of the peacock's tail, for example, is that females are supposed to prefer to mate only with males who have these great tails. And the cause of the males having this is female choice. And females choose both armaments, or ornaments such as this, and armaments such as the antler, antlers on deer. And at the same time that female choice is going on, the males are supposed to be competing with one another for access to females. And so the antlers are supposed to have this um, function of allowing successful or victorious males access to females. And females, and as a, in the, the original sexual section 1.0, there's a convenient uh, coincidence of objective here, is that females are supposed to prefer the males who are themselves victorious in male-male combat, so that there's no conflict of interest. Whereas in principle, of course, females might actually prefer males who were better fathers, but rather than ones who were good fighters because they don't necessarily go hand in hand. But the initial account has this uh, happy coincidence of interests. Now, uh, this basic narrative has 
reigned, if you will, since uh, Darwin wrote up until the 1970s. Now, its importance within evolutionary biology has varied. There's, there was a time when hardly anybody paid any attention to sexual selection and peacock tails at all, and then there were, and then particularly in the 1970s, interest resurfaced in the evolution of ornaments. And here's a statement of sexual selection 1.1 which is very close to Darwin's. And the only difference is that since Darwin's writing in the 1970s is that genes were discovered. So genes were then plugged into the Darwinian narrative to make uh, a restatement. And this is from Jerry Coyne, a geneticist at the University of Chicago. And I single him out because um, he wrote a scathing critique of my book. <laughs> so, and he states, and I believe arrogantly, we now understand, you notice the imperative tone, males who can produce many offspring with only minimal investment spread their genes most effectively by mating promiscuously. So here we have the promiscuous male instead of the passionate male. And female reproductive output, <coughs> excuse me, is far more constrained by the metabolic costs of producing eggs or offspring, and thus a female's interests are served more by mate quality than by mate quantity. By here, Jerry means mate genetic quality. So the idea is that males, because they make sperm, and sperm are cheap, that they're always on the make for chances to uh, fertilize a female. Females, on the other hand, have a lot of energy invested in their eggs, so they have to sit tight, look around, and chase out uh, who's, which males have the best genes. And um, it, through the 1970s and here in 2004, many biologists do believe that, that, that this is correct. Now, it's clearly not correct in general and maybe not ever correct. One of the major difficulties with that story is the phenomenon of sex role reversal. And uh, excellent examples are provided by species such as the uh, seahorses here and pipefish. Now, in, <clears throat> in uh, fish, when there's, male per when there's parental care at all, it's often provided by the males, usually provided by the males. In birds, when there's parental care, it's about 50-50 shared between males and females. And in mammals, the parental care is usually by the females. Now that in and itself is an interesting point because it means that the par parental role is not necessarily tied to gamete size. And um, now, in the case of seahorses in particular, well, first of all, t talking about pipefish, pipefish are a skinny little fish like this. They look roughly like a small flute. That's why they're called pipe fish. And on these, these fish um, glue the eggs to the bottom of their tummy. The males do and swim around with the eggs and take care of their young that way. And a seahorse is like a pipe fish that has a pouch on it that's uh, elaborated and into which the eggs are inserted. So this then is a male seahorse right here and this female is depositing her eggs into the male. And here's another case. So the male, in effect, becomes pregnant, and the male has to carry these young. And, and this is a very interesting phenomenon. This occurs in birds and mammals and fish. And Darwin knew about it, but um, gives no, Darwin gave no explanation for it. It's just sex role reversal. We named it. And um, this points out that uh, who does the parental care doesn't depend on gamete size. And in this sort of situation where the male has to tend the eggs, the males can wind up uh, being the rate-limiting step, if you will. That is, there can be more females swimming around with eggs to donate to males than there are males ready to receive them. So that, that sets up a shortage of males who are in a position to, to carry any more eggs. And so the females have to compete with one another for access to the males. 
And so this would be exactly the reverse, or the flip of the standard sexual selection narrative. Um, now that's problematic. <clears throat> so that gave rise to sexual selection 1.2 over here, which is from the 80s and 90s. And here the statement is that the sex with the higher proportion of individuals available to mate, okay, think about it. So if, if one, of the one of the sexes is tending a lot of young, has, is carrying young, they're not ready to mate, they're not available. So it could be either the male or it could be the female, but one of them is going to be more engaged in the offspring raising than the other unless they're exactly equal. So if they're not exactly equal, then one is bigger than the other. So the one who's doing the, the, the sex with the higher proportion of individuals who are not tending young, which is usually but not necessarily the male, spreads its genes most effectively by mating promiscuously, whereas the other sex, which could be the female typically, or supposedly typically, spreads its genes most effectively by selecting to mate with the genetically best partner. Okay, as you see right here, this is a major shift from sexual selection 1.0 and 1.2 because we now no longer have any necessary connection between sex or gender and sex role. And um, in many, now, this is unsatisfactory in a way because it doesn't say when this, status, when this situation should occur. Which, which sex should be the one which is doing most of the uh, mating and which, or, uh, which one is doing most of the parental care and which, which is the one which is hunting around for mates. So that's, for that, you need to make some local ad hoc argument about the, local, about the local environment. So pretend, if you will, that uh, seahorses or pipefish live in special environments where for some unknown reason, it's the males who should be doing all the parental care. So this is left unspecified and it's very unsatisfactory. Okay. And um, there it is. Now, the plot thickens. Is even this revision satisfactory? Because it, 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 it looks pretty good in that it, it, we don't have necessary male and female roles, but we've still got two roles. And now the question of whether there are even two roles is then highly suspect. First of all, the roles themselves are not stable. <clears throat> And this is a, it turns out that um, there are a lot of species in which the animals change sex. Now, in biology jargon, uh, the sex of an animal uh, rests with or is defined on the basis of the size of the gamete that it makes. Now, the gametes are the, the cells that have to fuse with one another to make the embryo. So the gametes are the sperm and the egg. And by definition, a male is an individual who makes the smaller of the two gametes, which is the sperm, and the female is the individual who makes the larger of the two gametes, which is the egg. It's a very good definition of male and female. It doesn't say anything by itself about gender roles or sex roles, and it works for everything. So you can go down to the ocean, you can pick up a, a seaweed, say, is this a male seaweed or a female seaweed? Well, what you do is you look at the little reproductive structures at the ends of the fronds, and then you look closely and you see whether or not there are eggs there or, or sperm there. And that's how you sex something. And so when something changes sex, when it, it means that they have switched from making tiny gametes to large gametes or vice versa. And if you go snorkeling on a coral reef, such as those in Hawaii, then about a third of the species that you see there these are fish, these are vertebrates. A third of those species are members of sex-changing species. And these are examples. Um, these are um, blue-headed wrasse here. In this species, the uh, individuals change from female to male as they get older, which means they change from making eggs to making sperm. And these are clownfish which uh, live in sea anemones. There aren't any of these in Hawaii, but there are in Polynesia. And they're, they're lovely fish that, in, in, 
see them in Aquaria too. Here they go the other direction. They're initially uh, male and turn into female. And these species here are called hamlets, uh, which um, are male and female simultaneously. So, and uh, one of them will uh, lay eggs. So this is, this is when they mate. They don't self-fertilize, they cross-fertilize, but if this one lays an egg, then this one will, will shed sperm onto it, then they'll switch over, and then this one will lay eggs, and this one will, will release sperm. So they'll, um, they're cross-fertilizing in this way. And we really have no theory for when this phenomenon occurs, but there's no doubt that it's extremely common. So the bottom line, though, is that the stability of the sexes themselves can't be guaranteed. And a supposition, of course, of sexual selection theory is that you actually have males to talk about and you have females to talk about, or at least you have two distinct roles to talk about. And here the roles clearly switch. Now, more than that, that's where they change, that's where they change actual sex. There's also um, the phenomenon that I've termed gender multiplicity. Now, um, I suggest, now the word gender, of course, is normally owned by the social sciences. And I've asked the permission of social scientists to capture the word and, and, ex and broaden its use. And many have agreed to let me do this. <laughs> and so um, by gender, I mean the way in which an animal expresses its sexual identity. Its sexual identity is, does it make eggs or sperm? But how does it express this fact about themselves? And to express it means to have a certain behavior and to have a certain shape and morphology and color. And so in this case of this species called the rough, there are actually three kinds of males. And I'll call these genders. They're all males because they make sperm. But uh, here's one of the types of males. This has a, a, a black collar around it. And I call it the black collared male. This is the white collared male. And this is the uncollared male here. And this is a female, and the female also doesn't have a collar. <clears throat> so when these mate, it's very interesting. The males all, um, at, at mating time, the males all uh, congregate at a location, which is called a lek, which is spelled L-E-K, a lek which is basically a red light district of males. <laughs> and it's the males go there looking for sex. And so they go to an area and each male uh, sets up a little court in the lek where he, he sits in, in this little space. And later on, the females will come and they'll look at them all and decide which one they uh, want to mate with, which ones they want to mate with. Now, um, so the black collared males are the ones that set up these courts in the lek. Now the white collared males are really interesting because they hang out with the females for, for longer. When, after the black collared males have left to, to set up the courts, the, female, the, the white collared ones are still with the females. Then the black collared males so, so then they'll, the white collared males will leave the females and fly to the lek. When they fly there, they're then courted by the black collared males. So they do a little courtship dance and they come and join some of the black collared males. So that later when the females come, they see some courts that have only black collared males in them and other courts that have black and white collared males. And the data show that the females prefer to mate with the, in the nests, in the courts, with a pair of males rather than just a single male. And so the white collared male has in effect assisted the black collared male in courting. It's been an aid. And the white collared male in return shares some paternity with the white collared male. So the black collared male pays for the service that the white collared male provides with um, shared paternity. And I've um, suggested that this, that the white collared male is in effect a marriage broker. <laughs> and, and why? That's because when the white collar, when the females come, how would they tell one black collared male from another? Now they're just both displaying or something. 
but the white-collared males can hang out with the females longer and get to know them. And so when they come and join a, a black-collared male, then they can basically make an introduction. And uh, that's a conjecture on my part, but it is obviously true that the white-collared male is bringing something to the equation. Now, also, there was an uncollared male that was discovered, and its role in the mating isn't yet clear. But this brings me to another phenomenon which is important, which is the existence of same-sex sexuality. Now, I'll distinguish between a same-sex mating and a, and a same-gender mating. So these would both be different genders. All these would be different genders. Here's a same-sex mating here in which a black-collared male is mounting an uncollared male. And according to the paper, it also goes the other way around. It's just coincidence in this photo that it's the black-collared male mounting the uncollared male. So I would call this homosexual and heterogenderal. Okay? But, of course, in many species, it's both homosexual and homogenderal. And uh, well-studied examples include these uh, bighorn sheep from uh, Montana. And here, this is a male-male mounting right here in the field. And um, there are now well over 300 species just of vertebrates known in which there's same-sex sexuality among the uh, animals in nature. And so for every one of these species, you can get nice photographs like this. OK, so what this shows is that there's a lot of variation in sex role. And in fact, the function of sex is called into question, but the function of mating is called into question by these phenomena. Because mating would appear to serve functions that have very little to do with the actual exchange of sperm. But they would serve a, a social function in the formation of the social system. Now, I have other objections to even a revised sexual selection definition. And I'll mention two others right now. One of them is that the, the cases which have been studied, one after the other, collapse. And, and I call these the failed poster child species. So you, you want to ask, are there any species for which the traditional sexual selection narrative is true, even as modified to uh, disassociate it from necessary male and female roles? And I think this question is open, but it looks to me as though there aren't any. And take, a, take this case here. These are um, collared flycatchers from uh, Scandinavia. And what's happened here is that this, in, in this species, this white spot is supposed to be a badge. And females are supposed to prefer males who have a big badge because Males with a big badge are supposed to have better genes and also to be more attractive. So it's in a female's interest, according to this story, to um, mate with these kinds of males and, and in so doing, ensure that her own offspring have good genes and are very attractive. Is it true? Well, the problem is the second line here. First of all, this is called the heritability. The heritability is a measure of how much the offspring resemble the parents. And a, a number 38 right here means that if the uh, parents deviate from the population average by, say, one millimeter, so suppose the parent has a one millimeter bigger badge right here, then this means that the sons will have a badge that's only 0.38 of a millimeter bigger. So that actually is pretty good heritability. It means if the father had a big badge, the kids, the sons will have a pretty big badge too. Okay, great. So badge size is inheritable. But this is the problem. The heritability of male fitness. Now, the fitness, fitness in this context is jargon for whether um, a male can, uh, sires a lot of offspring, whether a male puts a lot of offspring into the next generation. 
Now, at any one year, if you look at all the males, some of them are going to sire a lot. Some of them won't sire very many. Okay? And then you ask, well, one generation later, did the sons of those who sired a lot, did they also sire a lot? And did the sons of those who didn't sire a lot, were they also not very good at it? Well, no. In fact, there's a zero heritability, basically zero heritability. The ones who sired a lot this year have sons who may or may not sire a lot the next year. Okay, now that's really important because that means if you're a female casing these males out, okay, which, which ones have great genes, okay, you're wasting your time <laughs> <laughs> because they're all just as good. There's no her heritability of fitness differences. That's a really fundamental problem. Now, therefore, the heritability of female choice of badge size is also nearly zero. So if you as a female like big badges, do your daughters also like big badges? No. It turns out that your own preference isn't heritable. And the bottom line is that the correlation between female choice to male badge size is also zero. So the genetic correlation of choice and badge size is zero. And this is based on a whole lot of work. $85,000, $5,000, if, if only it was that cheap. Um, just imagine how much 85,000 uh, birds uh, costs or how much time it takes to capture, capture that many and mark them. Have you ever tried to catch a bird? <laughs> so you have to do this. And, and this is over 24 years, and it was published in Nature. Now this, very few studies have this kind of data to them. And, when you ha and I contend that when you actually do have a study where people put serious work into it and just didn't tell a story, but they actually checked out whether or not the story was correct, that time and time again, the story falls apart. And so in The Genial Gene, my most recent book, I have a catalog of all of these, at that time of writing, poster child species whose stories collapsed and burnt um, before your very eyes. <clears throat> and so it's very hard, including the peacock, by the way, uh, where the data are now very, un very unclear as to whether or not females really do prefer males with big tails. An important study showing that that isn't correct. Then. Uh, Another category of objections I have, which relates to the first, actually, is called the Leck Paradox. And this is jargon. I just, the purpose of this slide is just to introduce the phrase Leck Paradox, or Paradox of the Leck. And this is a big theoretical problem. And, it, and here's how it goes. That suppose, by hypothesis, just, just for the sake of argument, that um, females were choosing males for their genes. They're looking around, they're going to a singles bar, and they're casing out you know, all these guys. Okay, good genes there, lousy genes. Okay. And if they do that year after year, in about 20 years, all the guys will have good genes because all the bad genes will have been weeded out. So you will have selected, oh, you've pruned, basically, the male gene pool for, for good genes, and you've uh, sifted out the bad ones. So after a little while of female choice, all the males are equally good. So when that happens, why would there be any female choice anymore? So the selection pressure to maintain the female choice disappears. That's called the paradox of the leg. So in order to generate renewed interest on the part of the females in continuing to choose male for their genes, you have to generate a supply of bad genes. You have to keep renewing the bad genes so that males still have, so the females still have an incentive to keep looking out for them. And so the attempts to resolve the paradox of the leg primarily rest on finding unknown and undescribed sources of bad genes to keep a female choice going. Now, none, none of the suggested resolutions to the paradox of the leg have been demonstrated or verified. There are a bunch of them on the table, a dozen or so. And my suggestion is that the paradox of the elect is a real problem and that there is no resolution to it. It's fatal.
because when you think about it, that's exactly what you expect to see when you look at a picture like this. In the color flycatchers, the heritability of fitness is zero. All the bad genes have been weeded out. And so females are not choosing males for their genes. And the function of this badge has nothing to do with advertising male genetic quality. Instead, it's a signal. We've just kind of tapped into a telephone conversation. This, it's a, it is signaling, but it's not signaling good genes. And so there is some kind of social signaling system going on here in which this certainly plays a role. But the sexual selection explanation for this seems to me to be clearly false. So I've been making these objections now for a few years, and, um, and it's starting to um, uh, lead to some improvement. Now, in 2009, David Shuker, in response to my criticisms in an, in a, uh, an exchange in the, in the forum in animal behavior, suggested what I'm terming sexual selection 2.0. And he contends that this is a consensus definition of sexual selection today. And his response to my challenges to sexual selection are to say that, oh well, we've long ago abandoned any theory of sexual selection that has anything to do with sex roles. And he says, you're, you're attacking something that's out of date. Well, fine. If that's the case, fine. And if this is the consensus definition now by people who are sexual selection advocates, let's see what it says. Sexual selection now is the selection of traits associated with competition for mates. That's it. And he says sexual selection is not dependent on what have been termed sex roles. So what about the theory of sex roles? What males are supposed to do and what females are supposed to do? What happens to that? Well, that's now relegated to something called mating systems theory, which seeks to address why particular mating or breeding systems form. So the key elements to this latest revision of sexual selection theory are that the tra traits th that come from sexual selection have to do with competition for mates. Mating is a competitive process, not a cooperative process, but a competitive process. And furthermore, you notice that we begin with mating here, that the focus of attention is on mating and not on offspring rearing, because ultimately fitness is counted in terms of number of offspring put in the next generation. But the supposition is that how you mate and your success at competition for mate is, is the key, el key element or episode in the life history. Now, David did something very good here, I think, and in addition to, to this, uh, to framing this definition, he's, he gave sufficient conditions for sexual selection to be absent, even his, de his view of sexual selection. So one, all partners are of equal genetic quality, and two, or, and or two, successful partnerships are a random sample of pairs of individuals, individual phenotypes, individuals. Um, but that, that, that actually is met. That's exactly what happens here. Here, all the males have the same fitness. So by his criterion, all partners are of equal genetic quality, um, the sexual selection is false. And, and it's important to understand right here is that if the paradox of the Lex is genuine, then Schuker's condition number one will generally be met because there won't be any net difference in the quality of the males. But I think this is a real step forward because he's putting on the line what it would take to falsify sexual selection, whereas up until this time, we've seen a sequence of redefinitions of sexual selection as more and more data comes in making it look like sexual selection was unfalsifiable. Now, <clears throat> in light of this, it seems to me as though even a revised sexual selection is going to be false. So now we come to my suggestions as an alternative. So social selection, 
differs from sexual selection in two main ways. First, we start with offspring and work back to mating. So the idea is that we go into a situation and we see what does it take in this local ecology to raise a large number of young. And then we work back to whatever the mating system would need to be to give you the social system or the social infrastructure to rear a large number of offspring. So for us, the main element is offspring production. And then you work back to the mating system you need to get it, rather than in sexual selection where you start with mating and take the offspring production for granted, basically. And the second issue has to do with the logic with which we analyze uh, um, social behavior. Now, traditionally, in sexual selection, um, there's a top-down logic that's used where uh, one figures out what types of uh, strategies uh, are evolutionarily stable and then translates that into the expected behavior. In our case, what we do is we model the behavior and then um, move upwards to the gene pool dynamics. So this is an example of what I have in mind here in a so-called two-tier setup. This is a picture of a chess tournament in Wales. And uh, at each table right here, we have two kids, two children playing chess. And this is a room full of games of chess playing. Well, for us, each little table right here is like a bird's nest. And the two players right here could be two birds, and they're playing with one another, so to speak, to raise young. And then the population as a whole evolves when the production from each of the nests is summed up. And so you come, up, come again next year, you'll find the, the hall populated by players who did well from the year before. And so there are two tiers. There's the tier at which the nest dynamics occurs, the behavioral dynamics within the nest. And then there's the next tier, which is the evolutionary uh, tier at the population level. Now, they, in the game like this, the two players are playing competitively. But they don't have to play competitively. They could play cooperatively. Because chess is a game where the, where the individuals can't talk to each other, and they're just going at each other. One's trying to beat the other. But consider Monopoly. They could be playing Monopoly. In Monopoly, you can make deals and side payments with the player next to you and uh, buy and sell. So there, there, we could use an area of game theory called cooperative game theory if the dynamics of the nest was cooperative and then still add up over all those nests to get the gene pool dynamics. Whereas today, in the normal framing of sexual selection and behavioral ecology theories, the games are assumed to be competitively played. So our innovation is to introduce cooperative game theory at the behavioral tier. So that's, this is a schematic of that picture. Uh, we go from behavior to evolution rather than from evolution down to behavior. And in particular, um, I'm hypothesizing that one of the ways in which cooperative games are played at the behavioral tier involves physical intimacy and shared pleasure. And that the mechanism which leads to cooperation is the mechanism. It's not the evolutionary, it's the, it's the proximal mechanism, the immediate mechanism that promotes cooperative relationships has to do with shared pleasure, shared intimate pleasure. And, and these, in the case, these are primates here and you see all the close physical intimacy, the same sex, or this is between sex mating here. This is a lot of physical intimacy. Now let me show you a, a sequence of pictures with, with same sex physical intimacy that were uh, given to me when I was at a, 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 a TEDx uh, conference uh, last year in Brazil. There was a, a, a photographer on vacation in uh, uh, in Africa, and he just happened to take these pictures. And after he was done with it, he said, my god, this is amazing. And he found a friend of his in the newspaper, and in the magazine business in Brazil, and said, has anyone seen these before? And he gave them to his, his uh, 
his friend. So these have been published in Brazil. And when I was at this TED TEDx conference, this fellow came to me and said, you know, you really need to see these. And he gave me a copy of them. So here are two lions. These are males. You see the big mane on them. And this one comes up to the other, nuzzles it. If you have cats, you know. <laughs> you know, really. And goes and lies down. And then the other one comes and mounts it. And there it is. And it's this kind of physical intimacy in the emotional exchange of pleasure, which is what's leading to cooperative, or is one of the mechanisms, I think, that leads to cooperative behavior um, uh, in animals. Now, you see the significance of this, of course, is that this completely turns this focus of mating on on exchanging genes and so forth on its head. Because here we're finding mating having a social role for bonding and uh, producing, producing groups. And, and you can bet that these lions are also mating with females and are going to have cubs at some point. But this is the way they wind up um, a buddy, uh, getting good buddies. <laughs> so um, to, to conclude, I have just two slides. This one, which um, is unabashedly a plug from my books. <laughs> um, <laughs> Evolution's Rainbow here has now been translated into a Korean and Portuguese. And the genial gene is currently being translated into French. And I've been blessed with collaborators. Uh, Errol Ache is now a postdoc at Princeton. And uh, Priya, Priya Iyer is uh, working at a university in India. And both of them have been with me through this period. And, we've, and their work is discussed in some detail in the genial gene. So there we are. As you can see, the existence of gender and sexuality variation has provoked a lot of uh, critical rethinking in evolutionary biology. It's still pretty heated. Uh, it's not clear whether or not David Shuker's consensus definition is actually accepted as the consensus. Other people have objected to it. Um, I think it, 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 I can work with it. It's certainly a better definition than before, and there are clear criteria for how to falsify it. Um, but most biologists, and I certainly think most people outside of biology, still think that that sexual selection 1.0 is the, what's true about nature, that males are passionate and females cause. And that still is attributed to biology as what we're saying is the this, this state of, uh, of nature. But um, the advantage, of course, to the consensus definition from David Shuker is that it, it clearly disowns that whole history. But we do have the problem of whether that's good enough. And I think it's basically the sexual selection, even as revised, is wrong because of its initial focus on mating as the key event in successful reproduction. The initial focus, the primary focus, should be on the reproductive part, and you work back to the mating rather than on the mating part and working forward. And um, thank you very much for listening to me.